Nestled between towering mountains and azure seas lies the cradle of Western civilization, the astonishing world of ancient Greece. Recently in our video, the unspeakable things masters did to slaves in ancient Rome. We told you about the horrible lives and deaths led and faced by slaves in the Roman Republic and Empire, 1,000 years of slavery. In this video, we're going to tell you about a place that eclipsed even the Roman slave traders. Nothing quite goes hand in hand with the terms advanced civilization and home of democracy, then slavery, right? Welcome to History on Fleek. Today we explore the darker side of antiquity as we delve into the unspoken lives of slaves and the harrowing realities of sexual slavery in ancient Greece. Do as the Romans do. The Romans conquered Greece in the late 2nd century BCE. Quite a number of Greeks were likely stunned by the development. After all, Greeks were holding the first Olympic Games in 776 BCE, 23 years, give or take, before Rome was even founded. And even then, the glory that was Rome at the time was nothing but a large village that slowly began to expand over centuries. So imagine the shock of many Greeks as the Romans took them as captives, beginning around 150 BCE. Of course, this is an exaggeration for effect, but you can almost picture an Athenian in flowing robes on the steps of the Parthenon, looking down and saying to himself or other Greeks nearby, Slaves? Are we to be slaves of these barbarians? We aren't slaves. We take slaves. Yes, ancient Greece, the civilization credited with giving us democracy, math, geometry, philosophy, drama, and so much more, took slaves. And despite their fancy talk about democracy, etc., ancient Greece treated their slaves, most of them anyways, just like every other group of people has treated enslaved people. Badly. Sometimes extremely badly. Biremes and triremes. You might be familiar with biremes and triremes from movies and documentaries. Actually, these are Latin words. The Greek words for the same style of ships were dieres and trieres, but they had the same meaning in both Greek and Latin. Two or three banks of oars. These were the warships of ancient Greece and Rome, and there were even giant quadriremes and quinqueremes, warships with four or five banks of oars. Sometimes ancient Greek or rowing slaves are known as galley slaves, but that's incorrect. Galleys were ships of a later era. The primary weapon of these ancient warships was the ram, which was attached to the ship's bow and meant to deal a fatal blow to enemy vessels by puncturing their hulls below the waterline. Of course, some if not all of these ships carried archers and men armed with other weapons as well to launch attacks from a distance or board an enemy ship when damage from the ram was not enough to sink another vessel, or the two ships had been brought together by grappling hooks. Then a brutal hand-to-hand -hand fight would happen. Biremes and triremes, as well as the larger vessels, had sails. Still, they were square and generally did not allow for the kind of maneuverability and agility needed for close sea combat, especially considering that these ships were massed in large tight groups. The men who powered the warships were slaves, and like many enslaved people in ancient Greece, they were taken in war. The slaves that powered the ships of Athens against those of other city-states, such like Sparta, Corinth, or many Greek island leagues of the Aegean and Mediterranean, might just be powering their ships into others filled with their countrymen, perhaps friends or family. Worse still, if close combat happened because the ships were jammed or tied together, slaves were chained or otherwise fastened to their places. They sat there while deadly hand-to-hand -hand fighting took place within arm's length of them, Swords, short spears, axes and arrows were swung or shot around them. No one cared what happened to the slaves. Many were likely used as human shields that combatants danced around, trying to take cover or advantage of their enemies. Imagine being locked on a small wooden bench while dozens of men swing razor-sharp swords in a confined space. It's not hard to believe that more slaves died in some combat than did actual warriors. If you were on the wrong side of ramming and your ship started to sink, that was that. Any lifeguard will tell you that one of the most dangerous things about their job is not the water or the tide, it's the people they're trying to save. Drowning people panic. They grab hold of whatever they think will help them stay above water, even if they're chained to a seat. Panic means you're not thinking, you're reacting as any animal would, trying to save your own life. And for that reason, as well as the simple fact that they were slaves, probably meant that no one would bother trying to free them when the ship went down. Early biremes carried eight rowers. Early triremes would hold 12 or so. 
but that number increased to perhaps 50 or more as time went by, all screaming to be let loose before they sank into Poseidon's dark kingdom. Slaves for every need or desire There were dozens of Greek city-states, but the two most famous were Athens and Sparta. These cities and their allies sometimes fought as allies and often against each other as enemies. Despite their fearsome reputation, the Spartans did not always defeat the Athenians, and their eventual victory over Athens in the Peloponnesian War of 431 to 404 BCE in the end led to both sides being so weakened that they made easy pickings for the new power in Greece, Macedonia, under Philip II, father of Alexander the Great. Many writings that come to us from that time describe the Spartans as a savage warrior race, jealous of Athens' glory and learning. Of course, most of these accounts come from Athenian writers, which does say something about the types of places the two cities were after all. When people today think of ancient Greece, they most likely think of Athens first. Athens was the home of democracy and learning, and the early roots of what we know today were Athenian. But Athens was not the paradise that some, including the ancient Athenians themselves, wrote about. The democracy? Yes, for its time, it was advanced and unique. But the vast majority of people in Athens had no say in what went on in the city-state. Women, Athenian males under 18, men whose parents were not Athenian citizens, free foreigners like merchants, and most of those unable to serve in the military were not citizens. At the bottom of the Athenian social ladder were the slaves. It's impossible to know exactly what percent of the Athenian population were slaves. The consensus among historians is anywhere from 30% to 40% of the population. That's, that's a lot of people. And like you just heard with the rowing slaves, most slaves led miserable lives. That meant that almost half of the population of Athens was likely unhappy and resentful. And it meant that the Athenians, like the people you heard of in our video about slavery in ancient Rome, had to keep their eyes and ears peeled for any signs of rebellion or uprising. Interestingly, the man who led the most famous slave revolts in Roman history was a Greek, Spartacus, from the northeastern part of the country, Thrace. As in Rome, anyone rebelling against the system was punished severely or killed. Greeks did not crucify their slaves or anyone else, at least not in the way we're familiar with. They did kill people by what historians call bloodless crucifixion, however. Bloodless crucifixion was done by shackling someone to a board or platform with iron bands or rope by the wrists and ankles. Sometimes people died of exposure to heat or cold, or died of thirst, but most often they were strangled by a collar placed around their neck that would gradually be tightened. Rebellion was the worst offense a slave could commit, but depending on the circumstances and their owner, slaves who disobeyed, lagged, talked back, or broke other rules in place were likely whipped. It would also be a mistake to assume that, because of their lofty reputation, some Athenians, or any Greeks, weren't sadists who enjoyed having complete power over someone else's life. Tutors In the records of both ancient Rome and Greece, some of the most esteemed teachers or private tutors to the rich and powerful were slaves. In ancient Rome, having an educated Greek slave as a tutor for your children or yourself was considered a status symbol. The same held true within Greece. Educated Athenians taken captive in the many wars that enveloped Athenian territories were prized by other Greeks, just as they were later by the Romans. Slaves were private tutors and public and private teachers for groups of people. They lived a privileged life compared to other enslaved people in ancient Greece, but like all slaves, they could be sold at a moment's notice and mistreated by their owners for an endless variety of reasons. However, like so many of the actors, musicians, and poets of the time, especially knowledgeable and popular tutors, could enjoy a kind of fame in Athens. And this reflected well on their owners, who likely treated them relatively well, if not out of kindness or respect, then because mistreating a famous slave could reflect poorly on a person. Those who owned famous enslaved actors, tutors, and musicians, and even sex slaves were at the top of Athenian society, where one's public reputation was everything. Sexual Slavery Historically, people held in bondage from ancient times to today have suffered through sexual assault, sometimes almost constant sexual assault. In ancient Greece, both young and adult slaves of both sexes, desirable ones, were often held for one purpose only, the sexual pleasure of their owners, mostly the male owners. That isn't to say that some slaves weren't treated well. They often led lives of relative comfort compared to most other enslaved people. Masters wanted to keep slaves attractive, so they were likely well-fed. 
clothed decently, and, looking at it realistically, had other jobs, like in the kitchen or as household servants. That may have even gotten them some free time, but they were never truly free. This is History on Fleet, and we'll see you next time.